Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscribe today at bakerstreetjournal.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, Episode 144, The Chronologies of Sherlock Holmes. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Your Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! And uh, hey, 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 welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Burt Walder. Are you chronologically challenged, Bert? No, not at all. I've just wound my chronograph, and it's 922 and 37, 38, 30, 42, 41, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47 seconds, 48. Oh, hurry up. Wow. Now, is that on the Julian uh, chronograph or the Gregorian chronograph? It was on the Julian <laughs> calendar until Julian retired, and then it was on the Stixian calendar. Stygian. And, <laughs> the Stitching calendar, and now it's on the whaling calendar. Nice, nice. Well, that is a hint as to what we're up to here. Uh, we have a very special guest who's going to talk to us about uh, the chronologies that you may have encountered or may have not. Maybe this is a, a new thing we're introducing you to, but if you have had any experience uh, reading a uh, an annotated version of the canon, uh, whether it's the Les Klinger version or the Bering Gould, uh, you may have come across uh, people trying to put these stories in order. Uh, it's been a conundrum since, well, time immemorial, one may say. And our guest today is going to help explore that with us. Friends, it's absolutely essential. I mean, just think how tenuous your grasp on American and world history would be if you were uncertain about which came first, the War of American Independence or the War of 1812. Now, so you don't look ahead to our later contest, I think I can tell you that a war for American independence came before the War of 1812, but don't thank me. And that's just one of the great thinking tips you'll receive in this episode. <laughs> because, you know, Scott, when it comes to matters of chronology, it's all about putting one thing in front of another. That makes sense. But which one thing is that? Is it the chicken or is it the chicken scratch? <laughs> I think in our case, it's the chicken scratch. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, as uh, I think Sherlock Holmes uh, actually had a quote about that. Uh, maybe it was in the Granada series, I recall. Jeremy Brett as Sherlock Holmes uh, handing a note from Mycroft over to Dr. Watson. I think it was in the Bruce Partington plans. That's my brother Mycroft. He writes like a drunken crab. You'd better read it. Doctors are more used to hieroglyphics than normal human beings. Well, there you have it. <laughs> well so, done. Chicken chicken scratch from, from, from chicken scratch to calendars and chronologies. We've got it all here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. It's a shame you just missed the rest of that quotation where Watson replied, but all we have here, Holmes, is the word lobster, lobster, <laughs> lobster. What does this mean? <laughs> Uh, it means that there are no longer oysters overrunning the world. Uh, well, you know what is at risk of overrunning the Sherlockian world? Our friends at 
Wessex Press. Here in the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex, we are looking forward to Whitsuntide, when we remember King Arthur's glorious coronation and the strange adventures that came before him at the High Feast of Pentecost. But you have strange adventures aplenty, thanks to your copy of The Illustrated Speckled Band, the original 1910 stage production, in scripts and photographs, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, edited by Leslie S. Klinger. For the first time ever, Conan Doyle's own script is published with long-lost photographs from the original production, scene by scene. Ours is that wine, that water clear and cool, that very vineyard and the peaceful pool. Make merry in the month of May, with the pleasure only a volume from the Wessex Press can provide. Choose yours today. How excellent. It's a shame, you know, I didn't have my regular calendar set for Whitsuntide. <laughs> you, do, you mean the iPhone doesn't come with a default Whitsuntide uh, reminder? No. Last time I downloaded one, all it did was tell me the tides outside of Whitson, Massachusetts. It was completely useless. Oh, good Lord. Well, that's when you need a good tide waiter. <laughs> Well, we are lucky enough to be joined this time around by none other than Vincent W. Wright, or V-Dub, as I like to call him for short. Uh, Vincent is the proprietor of a blog called Historical Sherlock. Uh, we're going to talk to him about that in just a moment. He is a regular speaker on the Sherlockian conference circuit, and he has a very deep interest. Some might call it unhealthy in Sherlockian chronologies. Vincent, welcome to the show. Scott, how are you, sir? I am well. Now, let's just get this out of the way. Should I call you Vincent or Vince? I, lo- I like Vincent. Well, there we shall have it. We we are familiar with uh, one or two Vincents in the Sherlockian world. Yes, we are. It's a great name to have, and especially in this hobby. <laughs> That's great. Now, where do you hail from? Right now, I'm sitting in my office in Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Well, that's another... Mm-hmm kind of ground zero of uh, Sherlockian activity. Uh, oh, absolutely. Are, are you involved at all in, in regular uh, local Sherlockian uh, activities in Indianapolis? I have belonged to the illustrious clients of Indianapolis for 21 years. Holy cow, 21 years. Yes, sir. Well, you must be a keeper. <laughs> they haven't kicked me out yet, so uh, <laughs> I suppose so. That's wonderful. So, uh, let, let's go back in history, and why don't you share with us how you first got to know Sherlock Holmes? Absolutely. I love telling the story. Uh, like most people, I grew up knowing who Sherlock Holmes was, but you know, I had a, the occasional paperback on my shelves when I was a kid. I had lots of books when I was a kid, like I do now. Um, when I was in high school, I met a, a, a classmate who had just come in from another city, state, from somewhere, his father was an English major at one of the local colleges and had a massive library. And two of the books that he had on his shelf caught my eye one day, and they were they were the annotated Sherlock Holmes. And I borrowed them from Chris. That was my friend's name. I borrowed them from him, and I still have them. <laughs> and this was, I guess we were 13 or 14, maybe 15 years old. Uh, I was just so I was just so taken by them. After we graduated high school, Chris disappeared. I, I've never known where he went or what became of him, but I still have those two copies. I don't dig them out very often because I have my working copies, but uh, it was shortly after that that I discovered Jeremy Brett on PBS one night completely by accident, um, and I was hooked, and I realized the two things kind of went together. In 1996, I got transferred to Indianapolis with uh, Montgomery Ward, of all companies. Hmm. Um, and one day while perusing uh, the Encyclopedia Sherlockiana, the, the Bunsen version, the Brunson version, um, I saw in the back that there was a local Sherlock Holmes Society. And I thought, well, that would be something interesting to do. I'm new here in town. I don't know anybody except the people I work with and for. So maybe this would be a chance for me to get out and do something. I contacted them. The rest is history. 
Oh, that's wonderful. Now, where where had you moved from when uh, you arrived in, in Indianapolis? Southern Illinois. Okay. A little bitty town in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> well, I suppose this is the perfect time to say, uh, Chris, if you're listening, uh, Vincent still has your father's books. And... Uh, <laughs> If you'd like to claim them, his address – no, we won't go into that. <laughs> but that, that's actually – that's a wonderful keepsake. I mean, obviously, it's a, it's, it's a functional copy. It, it's, it's something you can still enjoy, but it's really a, a trophy of sorts, a, a memento from those very earliest days. And I, I don't know that we all have something like that. That's a good way of looking at it. I've, I've always kept them, uh, again – when I found other copies, I bought those because I knew I wanted to make notes myself and highlights and circles and arrows in the back of each one and all these kind of things. So I, I made sure that his copies were packaged away nice and neat, and they still are right inside my closet here off of my office. And in the event that I ever find him again, he can have his copies back. <laughs> well, we wish you lots of luck in that. Well, thank you very much. So the, the annotated then, that, that this was the Bering Gould annotated? That's correct. Okay. And that was that your first exposure to uh, someone trying to uh, chronologize the stories, to put them in chronological order? That was my very first exposure to it. My second exposure to it was a couple of years later at Dayton. I found a copy of I Know the Date Very Well by John Hall, and I realized all of a sudden that uh, in the annotated – in the annotations themselves, specifically the ones about the chronology, other names are mentioned. But, of course, they're just names on a page. I didn't think much of it until I actually had another book in my hands. Hmm. Suddenly I realized this is deeper than I thought it was. And I made it a point to try and collect as many of these as I could. Hmm. At the time, I had no idea there were so many of them. And then when the reference library came out, the Sherlock Holmes reference library came out, um, in the back are listed, I think, 12 or 13 different ones. And I was, I was on a mission. Well, there you go. And of course, the reference library, the Sherlock Holmes reference library, uh, is is a more deeply annotated version of the canon by Leslie Klinger. And mm-hmm. of course, Les Klinger and Andy Peck together uh, did. What, did they do their own chronology, or was theirs more of a summary of chronologies? More of a summary. Okay, yes. that that was uh, the date being. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. how many how many chronologies did they assess in that work? Oh, uh, a dozen or so, I believe. Okay, okay. Now, for those not familiar, I mean, I think the most famous of all the chronologies certainly is the Bering Gould, uh, and and it's probably such it, it's it's so famous because he actually built the annotated around it. You know, he just didn't, he didn't just go through and annotate the canon. He annotated it and chronologized it at the same time. So mm-hmm. it's kind of this, this magnum opus, uh, right. literally. And, um, th- there are, I think there are other, uh, chronologists that kind of pop out to, uh, to casual Sherlockians, shall we say? What, what, what are some of the more famous chronologies that, uh, you can just kind of tick off a handful? A handful of them. First off, uh, people that I talk to that are that are more computer literate, more computer savvy, they talk about uh, Brad Kefauver's Sherlock Peoria chronology that he has online. Um, some of the more deeply rooted folks, uh, there's uh, Ernest Zeisler, uh, Gavin Brind, uh, his book uh, is, is quite popular. Again, the John Hall book, the June Thompson book. And then there's some Others that are maybe quite not so well. I didn't list all of the more famous ones, but there are some others that are not quite as well known. Uh, Miss Holmes of Baker Street by Alan Bradley and um, uh, drawing a complete blank here. Oh, uh, uh, Sergeant. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm stumbling all over myself here. That's all right. Bradley and Sergeant. Okay. Um, I have, uh, I don't know, I guess there's there's probably about a half a dozen that, your average Sherlockian would know off the top of their head. That's impressive. Now, did did J. Finley Christ ever try his hand at uh, a chronology? J. Finley Christ did, in fact, try his hand at one, and it's actually one of my favorites. Well, I, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you have a favorite among all of these, and why? Well, I, 
I do. I, I still like the annotated, but not necessarily because of the dates that he comes up with. Okay. It's just it has a comfortable feeling to me. It's it's a it's it's just they're never off of my desk ever. Um so I love them. However, I have chronologies that I like and chronologies that I dislike. For instance, I dislike Ernest Eisler's chronology, whereas uh, Brad Kefauver calls him the king of chronology. Huh. I like Christ's chronology. I like Bryn's chronologies. They are very well thought out. They're not as drawn on as some others that make you want to skip entire sections. They're well detailed. They're thought out nicely. Um, they're, they're monumental efforts and I, I applaud them. Hmm. Now, do you know approximately how many, uh, years each of them put into that kind of work? Oh, goodness. That's an excellent question. Um, I don't actually, uh, there, there, I have a couple other, uh, things uh, concerning. I have 11 different databases for chronology wow. in my system here that I've, different things that I'm working on. I have not considered that one, actually. That is, that's a fascinating question. I'll have to look into that. Huh. Okay. Now, and you mentioned, um, you mentioned Zeisler as being your mm -hmm. least favorite while it's Brad's most favorite. Uh, what turns you off about Zeisler? Zeisler limits himself a little bit too much and has a tendency to come up with some odd dates um, because of the, because of the limitations that he puts on himself right up front. Um, and as such, whenever he runs into a corner, whenever he backs himself into a corner, he has to figure out some strangely creative way to get out of it. And in doing so, calls into question several stories because he really has no way out because of what he's done to himself. So he, he doesn't he doesn't allow himself any freedom at all to uh to run wild with uh with his findings hmm. and and you think you think the others have i think a good portion of them have now some of the chronologies that i have there actually are no explanations these are just folks that have put together the dates that they feel comfortable with but without explanation or without annotation so i can't speak for all of them but for the the major ones that we know um i feel like some of them try a lot harder than others do the john hall book is a very thin volume. If you pick up a chronology book and it's thin, you've got a problem. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, well, and and to me, you know, when I first read the annotated, and I think, I'm trying to think, I think around the same time I discovered Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street, which of course was was Baring Gould's biography of Sherlock Holmes, mm -hmm. which which predated the annotated. It it, it right. followed on the same chronology. But um, but but that was published first. I, I found his use of uh, lunar cycles and weather reports and um, you know just cross referencing so many different elements that that he could verify based on the accessible records of the time. I just I loved the reasoning and and I loved how he told at least in the annotated how he told the story of how he did it. Well, I I had to eliminate this and I looked at that and you know it, it was very seldom a as you know a, a slam dunk home run. You know yes this is certain uh, th those instances are few and far between in the canon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at very some point perfect. you just have to throw your hands up and go well this is the best I can do. And this is what I think. Right. And here's the reasoning, you know. So you're looking through all of these chronologies. When when did you say, you know, I I want to tackle my own? I started tackling my own uh, some years ago, maybe maybe six or seven years ago. Um, I actually have a, 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 a long-running commitment to my home society, the Illustrious Clients of Indianapolis, the newsletter. I put a, an article in there every time we put we we publish for the longest time. It was about the chronologies and the stories in time. It occurred to me that there was something I was missing, something I wasn't doing properly. And it was, it was after reading a number of these chronologies that I, that I figured this out. I wasn't really comparing the dates that I was coming up with to each other. And I began to think more deeply about uh, how to do this. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there simply 
isn't a way to make an absolutely correct chronology. Hmm. There, it, it just doesn't exist. There is something in the canon, without me telling you what it is, because it's something that I'm working on, that I believe requires a major rethink, something I'm trying to work on. And if I can get that to work, then I think a chronology is a lot more possible. But we have just far too many roadblocks and dead ends and staircases to nowhere. Hmm. Therefore, a chronology simply isn't possible. So I had to give up on my own attempt until I did a lot more research. And I'm telling you that research may take me another 10 years. Whoa. I, you know, Vincent, the world can't wait 10 more years, <laughs> especially well, with a teaser like that. I mean, come on, man. There are plenty of chronologies to look at and for people to examine themselves, which I know is not probably going to happen. I'm, we're probably not going to convert anybody here. I, I understand that. Um, but the the intricacies of the canon, and this is what you were talking about before with Bering Gould, yes, using the lunar cycles and the weather reports and the fog, all of those things are fantastic. But in doing so and basing your chronology on that very heavily, you're ignoring an awful lot. And it, to me, if you want to date a story, you have to do many, many things, which includes you have to compare it to the other stories. You have to dissect every single word of that story. You have to be careful of when it was published versus when it was written, because Watson may have thrown a term or a phrase or a word in there that didn't exist at the time that the story actually happened. So these are the kind of things that you have to keep in mind. This requires every single story to be broken down to its absolute bare bones. And there isn't a chronology out there that does that. In order for this to happen on top of a regular life with grandchildren and chihuahuas and the whole thing and a job, <laughs> it's going to take some time. And, and I'm working on it, but it, it is going to take me some time. And so far, nobody has jumped up and offered to help me. So I'm I'm kind of a one-man band here. Well, So there's so much to do with this project in order to say, yes, this is the absolute date for this story, or no, there simply isn't a possible way to date this one absolutely. Well, I, I think you hit on it. I, I, we may need to crowdsource this with you. <laughs> you, you mentioned there's this, this sticking point. Uh, can, can you give us any hints as to you know, what you're trying to wrap your head around or what you're trying to, to rationalize. Well, um, we could help. See, how can I, how can I, how can I put this without giving anything away? There's only two people on the entire planet besides my wife. And believe me, she could care less about this. There's only <laughs> two people on the planet that know what this thing is besides myself. And when I told them, when I told both of them, um, they both got this look on their face, like, I never thought of that. Hmm. So I'm, I, I don't know if I can, I don't know how much I can, can give you. There is a major problem with Watson's marriages that I believe requires a complete rethink, a complete reevaluation. And once that is settled, then I believe that a, as close to possible chronology can be written for the canon. Yeah. Well, Watson's marriages, or marriage, you know, and he's been married one, two, or three times, depending on who you believe, who you read. Mm -hmm. They've mm -hmm. always been uh, one of the stumbling block blocks here. Um, I I absolutely agree. Um, and I think there's a way around it. Okay, I really do. But that's what I'm working on. That's, okay, that's what I'm. That's what I'm always working on if I have five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, whatever, and I put aside everything else, that's the one I'm working on. Well, your secret is safe with us because nobody listens to this show. <laughs> I'm, good I'm so relieved. Yeah. <laughs> the Baker Street Journal has been doing its thing for 72 years, and some of the most heralded names in Sherlockian scholarship have appeared in print between those yellow covers. People like 
William Baring Gould, whose famous annotated Sherlock Holmes and his earlier Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street made the chronology of the stories something of a spectator sport. Names like Bell, Christ, Brend, and Zeisler, all of whom are heralded as scholars and chronologists, appear throughout the Baker Street Journal's history. In fact, the very first issue of the journal contained The Watson Problem by S.C. Roberts, who called for a comprehensive chronology when he wrote, Trifles such as these may be of some interest to the amateur of Apocrypha, but it is to be hoped that serious students will rather devote their energies to the elucidation of the major problems of Watsonian chronology, the complexity of which we have sought but to adumbrate. You can see all of these for yourself in the EBSJ, an electronic record of the Baker Street Journal from 1946 to 2010. It comes on a single DVD that's easily downloaded to your computer and is entirely searchable. It's just the thing you need to save yourself some time. Speaking of which, it's time that you got over to BakerStreetJournal.com and ordered your copy today. Now let's let's say you were to bring on a um, an irregular division of uh, eyes, ears, and uh, mouths that that could uh, or feet, I guess that could go everywhere, overhear everything, see everything, help you out on this. How would you get someone started in this? What what would you tell them to do if they were trying to sink their teeth into the things that you do for the chronology? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think the first thing I would do, especially with the what, what it is that I'm working on, is I would tell them right up front what I think the problem is and for them to tackle it and see, you know, ring it and see what comes out for them. Um, one person that knows about it is not interested in chronology at all, whereas the other person is very interested and may actually be working on it as we speak. Um I have a few people in mind that I would I would dearly love their help. Um, it's just a matter of me getting to the point where I can comfortably contact them and say, okay, this is what I have in mind. Are you interested? Because what I'm actually doing may turn out to be Sherlockian heresy. <laughs> so I I have to be oh. very careful with uh, with who I pick. Now we've got a show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we are looking to, uh, to, to condone this kind of crime, but, um, this would be wonderful if, if, uh, folks could reach out and, and, uh, get in touch with you and see how they might help because, uh, it sounds like you're really onto something here. It's, uh, it, it's got more and more, uh, speed lately. I, I've, I've been toying with the idea of a society for, chronologists or chronology Mm -hmm. um and it just started off as kind of a a thought and i put a a blog out about it saying this is something i've been thinking about and within weeks i had gotten two dozen responses from people saying i think this would be fascinating so there's more interest out there than i was aware of outside of those of us who consider ourselves chronologists there are actually people out there who are on the fringes who admit in secret in the dark rooms that (laughs) They actually do like chronology and this is something they might be interested in doing. So I've got, I've got the fodder. I've got the people. I've got the group. Uh, it's just a matter of me being ready to present it to, uh, the, the small public at large about this and, and see what everybody else thinks. If I get, if I get, uh, rotten tomatoes and things like that thrown at me, then I know I'm on the right track. There you go. It's, it's the ability to provoke. Right. So you mentioned a lot of internal reference work, uh, comparing stories to each other, uh, really parsing out each individual story down to each each punctuation uh, mark and, and each word, looking at the dates when they were published versus when they were written. Do you use any external sources for your uh, chronology uh, researches? Oh my goodness, uh, Scott, let me tell you, uh, I probably research more than I do anything else except breathe and love my grandchildren. <laughs> research is my, is my, my life. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do it in the middle of the night. I do it in the middle of the morning. I do it on the weekends. Whenever I can, I always have my phone with me. I always have a, a reference book with me of some time, of some type, maybe even a copy of the canon with me. 
sometimes I just flip through and find things and just research the snot out of it. Other times I specifically am looking for something, but I am always on Google Books, Internet Archive. Um, I have probably 50 or 60 different blogs that I follow that are Victorian minded. Hmm. Um, I subscribe to the London Times archives. Uh, I'm always looking, I say always, I say several times a week, I'm looking at uh, British new- newspaper archives. I am constantly, constantly looking uh, pretty much everywhere. And I have an entire section of my library that is nothing but books for research. So when I find nothing online, I go to them. If I find nothing there, I try something else. Well, you're really living in the perfect age for doing what you're doing because you can actually access so much information just on your keyboard, you know, through the computer, through the Internet. That's very true. However, that's not necessarily a good thing. The amount of information that you have can actually cause you to have problems. Um, one of my other small hobbies is the the Shakespeare authorship question. Now, I have no dog in this fight. I don't care which way it goes. I'm just fascinated with the detective work that goes into it. Um, however, anytime any new piece is found that might help it, it seems to cause more questions than it causes answers. And it's exactly the same with the research that I do. If I find something that says something one way, uh, I'm going to find 10 other pages that say that it, that's absolutely incorrect or, uh, there's, there's a problem with the research or there's a problem with the, with the provenance or something. So having the world of knowledge at your fingertips is a wonderful thing, but it's what causes me to have to work on something for 10 years because there's so much information and not all of it, uh, coalesces very well. Well, and I, I guess that would lead to the uh, the obvious question. How do you know when you've done enough research? Research never stops. Uh, it doesn't with me. I'm the kind of guy that's still working on a paper the day of. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the guy that's in the back of the room you know, who's going on in 10 minutes, and I'm still making notes on the sides of my paper. Um, you don't know when you've done enough research because – you know, and I know, and I realize this, that if I were to put out a chronology and I was to say, I have done every drop of research I possibly can, this is as definitive as it gets. I know that there's a possibility that I could go home that night, open my computer and find an email from somebody saying, oh, by the way, it was just discovered that this particular station didn't exist on that date or uh, or this particular uh, type of shoe didn't exist at that time or something like that, Mm -hmm. which would change everything. So you're never done researching. Well, that's why there are errata slips and second editions, right? Uh, I agree. And uh, and I think if I were to actually put out a book, I would have to title it something like, this is just the first try or something like that, because I know that there would be more and more and more uh, coming out later because there's always something new being found, whether by me or by somebody else. Well, and, you know, I I was initially going to ask you if if there's ever, if, if, if you ever foresee the end of, of, of chronologies. I mean, we, we've got this dozen or so that exist and have existed for some decades. Um, if, if you get to the point where you, you, you think you've wrapped everything up, you've solved the, the, the major sticking point that you mentioned before. Do you think there's still room for someone else to come along and tear it all down and start on their own chronology? Let me take you back just a, just a couple of seconds in what you said there about the 12 chronologies that everybody knows about. I actually have 23 chronologies in my, <laughs> in my collection. Okay. And I know of two that are being written as we speak and one other person who is dead set on having one before they die. So no, I don't think it's ever going to end. And the reason that I don't think it's going to end is because If you're going to do any kind of scholarly, canonical work, I'm talking about absolutely in the pages of the canon and nowhere else outside of it, then you have got to look at every detail possible in order to date these stories. 
in doing so, of course, you come up with all these other little tangents that you can do great papers on and or or little side columns and say, did you know this or or have you ever heard of this in different publications around the country? However, doing an actual chronology requires such a deep level of research. And anybody who is a researcher like I am knows how wonderful it is to find and 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 discover that no, I don't think there's ever going to be an end to it because there's there's more work to be done. None of the chronologies that exist are the definitive one because everybody knows that there's something that's wrong with it. There's a there's a detail in there that they disagree with. So no, I, I don't believe it's ever going to end. Will we have a lot more classics published in the future? I doubt it. I think any chronology book that's going to come out from this point on is just going to be saw seen as a curiosity, kind of like the the others are. So there's no more classics waiting to be had. But I still think there's some fine research to be done, and there's some diehard researchers out there doing it. So I don't see chronology ending anytime soon. Hmm. Well, given given that, and given our call to arms, we we mentioned before, if folks can uh, pitch in and help you here. I almost wonder if if a potential chronology of the future, and I'm not saying it's yours by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but if you know there are these differing points of view, and there are enough people involved, I wonder if a something like a Wikipedia for uh, the canonical chronologies would would make sense, where people can uh, kind of come together as an editorial board, uh, make decisions. Uh, and perhaps battle it out with each other. Uh, I, you know, I recently read an article uh, just this week in the Wall Street Journal that there is a there's a board on Wikipedia that settles disputes, almost like the Supreme Court. And uh, a Sherlockian in our midst is actually a member of that Wikipedia board settling those disputes. Oh. So that's fantastic. So we, we've got we've got some uh, some heavy hitters in that regard. D- do you think that kind of maybe that that group participation would lend itself to something more definitive or something uh, that that might actually become a classic? That's distinctly possible, and it's something that uh, again going back to the idea of a society for sh- for chronologists uh, and possibly a a publication, uh, maybe the occasional. A gathering, even though the joke's already been made that we'd never be able to agree on a date. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I think it's possible that, that a, a meeting of the minds, as it were, and there are some, there are some diehard chronologists out there who are just not making themselves well known. They're, they're doing this in their homes and, and one day they're going to appear with this, this, this stack of papers in their hands with this, with a light shining behind it screaming, I got it. And we're all going to, well, people like me, we're all going to immediately latch onto it and, and, and devour it. Um, so they're out there. And I have had several people approach me and say, if you ever want to do a book about this, I'd be interested in helping out. So, yes, I do believe that it's possible for there to be a uh, uh, a brain trust for this kind of thing. Um, however... Along those same lines, an idea I had numerous years ago was if I were going to put out a book about chronology, perhaps it could be um, like a double column kind of thing. On one side is the the sticking points, and on the other side are all of the possible uh, uh, findings and and and. And and logic points that you can come up with for that. Mm -hmm. You say, well, if this date works, then that means you have to ignore this. If you don't ignore this, then how is this in there? And so on and so forth. And then once all these are corrected, how does it fit into the Watson's marriage problem? And so on and so forth. So uh, there, these kind of ideas have been floating in my head for some time. But that that last one, that last one is almost like a choose your own adventure. That's exactly right. That's exactly what I called it uh, when I put it on my blog. I, that's exactly what it was. And I love those books. I remember reading every one of those I could get my hands on when I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it's the exact same thing that you're talking about. Uh, if you take a story and you say, okay, this is the proposed date. Here are the problems with that proposed date. And each one of those has its own 
a little offshoot from it saying, if you accept this, then that means you have to ignore this and so on and so forth. So, yeah, it's exactly what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really what that is, is just a logic tree. You know, I mean, you could build that online as easily as you could uh, manufacture a book out of it. So precisely, um, precisely, which yeah. is, you know, that was an idea that was uh, something similar to that was given to me by somebody not long ago. Um, but it would take it would be a bigger brain than mine for for something like that on uh, on online because yeah. uh, I do OK online, but I'm not a genius. So uh, <laughs> I do have I do have people out there who would be willing to do that for me as well. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. So you get around and you speak to Sherlockian conferences quite a bit. Uh, I know uh, we were on the program together, I believe, at uh, Scintillation of Scions. That's correct. And uh, and you've been back there a number of times. I have. Um, wh- what are some other uh, places where you found yourself uh, behind the podium? I have spoken, I can actually name them all. I have spoken in Minnesota, hmm. Tennessee, Ohio, Indiana, of course, uh, and Maryland. Excellent. Those are the, those are the places I've been. And I've been lucky enough to speak every, somewhere every year since 2010, hmm. which was the first time I ever stepped out into the speaking game and then it was, was on the circuit. And that was at scintillation three. Um, wow. I have been to every one since then and I've been lucky enough to speak more times than anybody else. And it's because I'm con- I'm consistently asked to come back because my subject matter is always interesting. And I guess I deliver a good paper. I don't know. I just hope that I do. So I- I've been lucky to to deliver everywhere. And it seems like every time I put together a paper within months, I'm delivering it somewhere else because somebody's heard about it. So <laughs> I-, I must do a good job with them. But for me, it's just a labor of love. Well, you are clearly scintillating. So ah, yes, I love that. Do you uh, do you do you typically just talk about the chronology or do you, do you, is, is your paper giving, uh, more varietal than that? It's, it's very varietal. Uh, and I always try and tie chronology back into it somehow, but no, uh, my, uh, I gave a paper a couple of years ago in Dayton. Um, and the title of it was a word about hanging. And it was all about hangmen who were in service, at the time, at the in, during the Victorian era, um, it didn't really talk about Holmes that much. Uh, I, I did another one uh, two years ago, I believe, where I talked about uh, the perils of dying in Victorian London because of the things that could happen to your body after you were dead. Again, not necessarily chron- chronological in any way, but at the very end, I did tie in Holmes just barely. So no, I don't specifically just talk about chronology. I have, uh, in Minnesota three years ago, two years ago, three years ago, I gave a paper about chronology specifically. It was the longest paper I've ever given. It was up there for 45 minutes. I loved every minute of it. And it's, I've given that paper three times since then. It's, it's been so popular. Uh, I've even helped uh, people with other papers that they're writing because they saw this and they, they associate me with, with the chronology. So, I've had some success with it as far as people contacting me, which is a constant thing, let me tell you. Mm. Um, but no, my papers are not always about chronology, but they are always, always about Victorian London in some form. Got it. Got it. And do you, do you typically find inspiration as you're doing your chronology work, or is it just does, – does it come to you in other ways? No, no. I uh, it's it's rare that I get a, an idea for a paper just kind of out of the blue. It does happen on occasion. In fact, uh, I, I may be speaking uh, in the Midwest here next year at a large gathering that it hasn't been confirmed yet. But I have a great idea for a paper that just came to me one day while I was at work. Just blip, there it was. <laughs> so that happens every once in a while. Most of my papers come from research, uh, and I I recently wrote an article for our our home newsletter saying. I think it would be interesting to see the process. And I think I put this on Facebook as well. It would be interesting to see the process of the research, how you start off with one thing and you wind up in a thousand other places. Yes. So those thousand other places are where I get a lot of my ideas for my papers. Well, that's fantastic. And we are the richer for it. Well, I certainly hope so. Well, if folks would like to check out your work, we will have a link to it. Uh, in the show notes, uh, but just for reference, it is historicalsherlock.blogspot.com. 
and right. it's, it's subtitled Examining the Chronology of the Sherlock Holmes Canon. That's correct. So where can we see you next, Vincent? The next absolute speaking engagement that I have, I will be at um, Saturdays with Sherlock uh, in November in Baltimore at the Enoch Pratt. Um, my next gathering that I will be at will be at a scintillation of science. I, I promised Jacqueline Morris years ago because she was the first one to allow me to speak at a gathering anywhere besides my home society that I would always come to the scintillation and I always have. So I will be there every year in June when it happens. So that's where you can always find me in the middle of June. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. Uh, we do. I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Wow. That, that makes two of us. Fantastic. <laughs> and, and maybe there's a couple more in the audience. Who knows? <laughs> Certainly hope so. Yeah. Well, that's probably more than you ever wanted to know about chronologies. <laughs> Well, you know, it's another it's another illustration of the fact that Sherlock Holmes, the cases of Sherlock Holmes can really be a canvas mm. for so many other interests. And it's amazing that his cast of mind, you know, digging into this, trying to solve things. I'm very curious, though, what is that one item that will solve, you know, all the problems? And uh, it's very tempting to think there's just one little piece of the puzzle that we need to discover and then everything else will fall into place. Mm. Mm. Well, we've got a bit of a hint there from uh, from Vincent, so uh, hopefully that will be more forthcoming. And I, I love the idea of people banding together to help solve this, uh, to, to help solve the chronological problems. Uh, I, I don't know if there's anything to it in the future, if there's a, a you know, kind of an online study group, or as uh, Vincent said, this, this notion of uh, a potential uh, science society for chronologists or people interested in chronologies. But it seems to me that groupthink – uh, like Wikipedia, in this case, uh, would, would help arrive at some of these conclusions a little faster. Yeah, well, I think that's that's right. I'm sorry that I just couldn't join that um, conversation well, with Vincent, but you did a, I it's, you did it's a great job. It's your fault. There. I mean, you should have set the TARDIS a little earlier. <laughs> yeah, my chronologist wasn't wound properly, and I had to be somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> well... Uh, let's move from a chronology to, uh, over to, uh, some, some newsy type items, if we can do that. Oh, good. Well, the first item that I found, and this is absolutely fascinating because it seems like we've been waiting forever uh, for this news. Have you have you seen the uh, Robert Downey Jr. Jude Law uh, Sherlock Holmes movies? Oh, really? Robert Downey Jr. made movies, huh? Uh, not se- I haven't seen any of his pictures since Chaplin. What's he been up to? Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, no! Of course, he and uh, he and Jude Law took their turn on the big screen as Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Watson in two thousand nine with Sherlock Holmes, and then followed it up, I think, in twenty twelve with. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, A Game of Shadows. Really? Which, um, how was Downey's Watson? I would think he would have been pretty good. <laughs> he does a remarkable Nigel Bruce. <laughs> no, actually, Jude Law's, uh, Watson was, was quite good. Stalwart. Uh, hmm. stalwart. Uh, Game of Shadows was in 2011. Uh, and, uh, folks have been speculating about, um, whether or not there would be a third installment with, uh, with Guy Ritchie as uh, the director and, of course, Lionel Wigram as one of the uh, producers or co-writers. Uh, well, we finally have the news uh, from Deadline Hollywood that this uh, this threequel, as Hollywood calls it, will be making its turn. It will happen um, just days after the opening of Avatar 2. Uh, mm-hmm. So it will be on, on uh, December 25th, 2020. Now, this, I presume, is just your effort to kickstart some sort of fundraiser, some sort of request for donations, some drive for contributions whereby all of us 
can kick in five dollars, ten dollars, different levels to get different th- things, T-shirts. You know, if you contribute a hundred dollars or more, uh, you know, special bonuses if you contribute five hundred dollars. All to the effect of preventing this from being produced. <laughs> Uh, I hadn't thought of that, but that's uh, that's a. (laughs) And I I think that's pretty shabby of you. But uh, hold on while I write out my check. Hey, if it means that we can keep this podcast going for another two years and try and get Robert Downey Jr. on as a guest or Jude Law, I mean, let's let's go for it. I don't find those things necessarily connected. I think that we could probably have a shot at getting Jude Law without a third movie. In fact, I'd, I'd like to vote with, you know, really enthusi- several times for doing that without necessarily getting a third movie. <laughs> well, you are probably aware of this. Jude Law was actually in uh, the Granada series. No, I don't remember. I, yeah, I vaguely remember that. Who did he play? He was young. He was very young. Uh, he actually. It was Billy the Page, probably. Almost. Almost. He was in, um, The Disappearance of Lady Francis. No, no, no. Sorry. Back up. He was in Shoscombe Old Place. And he played the stand in for, uh, Lady Beatrice. Oh, well, I gotta go back and screen that. Yeah. A very, very young Jude Law. In drag. <laughs> So, so it kind of fits with Robert Downey Jr. being in drag in, uh, in the last one. So. His best costume was of the drapes, I think. And that was, I think, <laughs> in the second picture where he, uh, you know, was, was made up to blend into the background of the room. And without saying anything against his ability as an actor, he's a good actor. He really is. Yeah. I think that was the best moment in the film. In fact, I think if they could have done two hours of him as the drapes, it would have been a big improvement. <laughs> Well, other news in the Sherlockian world. I, you know, this is a bit of inside baseball, but it's certainly uh, still worth remarking upon. Uh, we saw each other, you and I did, at the uh, Speckled Band Dinner in uh, the early part of the month. And, of course, this was an historic occasion for the band because it was the first time in the organization's 78 years that uh, women were welcome to its annual dinner. And... uh after seeing the number of kidneys in the steak and kidney pie, I'd be surprised if they came back. <laughs> it, was it was a great meeting and notable for two or three things. One is the return of our keeper, uh, Dan Poznanski, who had been, you know, way late over the last few years, but who made a very strong return. And it's great to see Dan looking so well. The grace of the speckled band, which in the past, has referred sort of specifically to men has now been very cunningly edited so that it refers uh, generically to children, but that was very warm. The wonderful participation of women, including our pals Sonia Featherston and Kathy Piffett and uh, Evie Herzog was there and um, many more, which was really uh, – it was, it was a grand meeting and your attire – because for the first time you wore the actual uh, early 20th century frock coat, vest, and other uh, aspects of the wardrobe that was worn for many years by our departed uh, John Constable, had been the speaker of the band, who very thoughtfully bequeathed that to you. And um, it was great to to uh, see you there wearing that and to hear through your impersonation the echoes <laughs> Of John Constable's yeah. voice in that old club in Boston, yeah. so it was a grand, it was a grand meeting. It really was, it really was, and uh, that that suit, you know, it was made for a a physician in Cambridge by a uh, by a Cambridge tailor over a hundred years ago, and uh, it was given by that physician's widow to Doctor Constable. So it's got a a wonderful heritage, and. Um, <laughs> And and uh, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the Speckled Band, about what goes on there, uh, about some of the people behind it, and Dan Poznanski, the current keeper, uh, you can check out episode 177, ihos.co slash ihos77, all lowercase. We'll get you there, and uh, we'll throw a link to that in the show notes. It can't be 177. 77. 77. 77. Right? ihos77. 
Yes, day one. That's the one. Well, you've been patient. You've waited. It is now time to get to the canonical couplets. Well, we're pleased to say that as of last time, we we changed the rules up a little bit. We decided to open up the canonical couplets competition to anyone, not just folks who may happen to be patrons, uh, financial supporters of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. And let me just say that worked out splendidly. Uh, we got quite a few uh, entries, so many that we have had to put our entrance into a random generator to see who's going to pop up with the right answer. Now, if you don't recall, the last canonical couplet went as follows. Poor lady, victim of a pious knave, was almost buried in a double grave. Do you know the answer to that, Bert? Oh, yes, even I know that. That's the disappearance of the Lady Frances Carfax. That is absolutely correct. And I am proud to say everyone who entered got it right. So now we will spin the big random number generator and see whose number comes up. Ha! What do you know? Number five. And that leads us to Warren Nast. Warren, thank you for being part of this. We will get in touch with you and let you know what your prize is for winning the Canonical Couplet competition. And now, for those of you wanting to participate this time around, get yourselves ready, because here is the latest Canonical Couplet. As plots go, this is nothing less than gorgeous, involving sliced Napoleons and the Borgias. If you think you know which... Sherlock Holmes story, that canonical couplet refers to, jot it down in an email, send it to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com, and put canonical couplets in the subject line. If you are among those who guess correctly, we will put you in the random number generator, just like we did this time around, and you will be selected to win a prize from the vaults of IHO's Holdings. Excellent. Well, any other pearls of wisdom before we get on our way? Uh, no, I can't. I think, uh, uncharacteristically, I'm devoid of anything that resembles an insight, brightly polished or otherwise. <laughs> well, I still think you're quite incisive. <laughs> oh, those are only my teeth. <laughs> well, let them gnash and wail as they will. You will remain Bert Walder. And you will remain Scott Monty. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. Hang on, that didn't come out right. 